Among the thousands of pages of classified U.S. documents released this week by the website WikiLeaks were U.S. military intelligence and field reports which accused Pakistan's inter-services intelligence, the ISI, of arming, training, and financing the Taliban insurgency from 2004 to 2008 and fuels doubts about the Afghan war. The documents detail Pakistani military financing supplying and training of both the Taliban and al-Qaeda. The U.S. Congress recently agreed to a $7.5 billion civilian package for aid package for Pakistan over the next five years. And ministers from both governments agreed to building closer ties. And President Obama this week said that the leaked documents, the disclosures revealed about the mishandling of the Afghan war justified his decision to embark on a new strategy. Today we are speaking with Pakistan's ambassador, Abdullah Hussein Haroun, Pakistan's ambassador to the United Nations. I'm Pamela Falk for CBS News. Ambassador Haroun, it's a pleasure that you are here with us today, and we are all wanted to express our sympathy to all the families involved in the airplane crash in Islamabad. Thank you. Ambassador Haroon, with regard to the documents, some analysts say that these documents are old. Some say that the problem is cleaned up. But the fear in the United States is that some elements in the Pakistani intelligence do have alliances with the Taliban. How does your government feel about this? Pamela, it's a very strange phenomenon. When something needs to happen, it normally comes in what the public invents as an orchestrated fashion. You have the Afghan statements from Spanta and Karzai. You have the American leaks and then David Cameron's statement in India. Precisely. All three, like a well orchestrated symphony. Now, I'm not suggesting anything really bizarre. There has been a checkered past. The Americans wanted the ISI many years back to help chase out the Russians. And they knew about all the contacts at various levels. Now, if those are rehashed and rehashed and rehashed, they can be rehashed a million times. It's much like Terminator 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and on. What I'm trying to say is that there have been contacts before. Everyone knows that. But can you believe that that is going to influence the Taliban today? Or whether that continuity remains? I would just like to read uh, just very shortly for you two things which are very pertinent to this argument. One, my um, daily Bible, the New York Times, much of the information, raw intelligence and threat assessments gathered from the fields in Afghanistan cannot be verified and likely comes from a source aligned with Afghan intelligence which considers Pakistan an enemy and paid informants have also contributed. Some describe plots for attacks that do not appear to have taken place. Now that is a very important statement in and my mind in the New York Times, which is what is in the report. I read the report. There will be certain things which are verifiable, but much of what is said is by so-called Afghan agents in the field and how de dependent they have been previously would not have got you into this quagmire of the war today if they were dependent. And today the results in Afghanistan, which speak for itself, shows adequately that these agents have not been doing their job well. Now all of a sudden, they are taken as the gospel truth and displayed in willy leaks and whatever. But I think the Times has taken the right attitude. It is non-verifiable. Much of it is from people who consider... Pakistan an absolute enemy. And would, would, so in your words, would you say today there is any liaison, uh, old rogue agents or any kind of liaison 
between the Pakistani intelligence and the Taliban? Pamela, my life with the Taliban by uh, Abdul Salam Zaif, a great bestseller here, he echoes what the Taliban thinks about Pakistan and the ISI. A couple of one-liners to give you a very quick feel uh, on this issue. Tripartite talks between Afghanistan, Pakistan and America are always sabotaged by Pakistan. Shows how confident he is of something like that on behalf of the Taliban. Then I quote, Pakistan, I told him, is never an honest, this is to the US ambassador, Pakistan, I told him, is never an honest mediator and will control and manipulate any talk they mediate or participate in, showing adequately they're not willing to talk to Pakistan. He then says, when he's speaking to the uh, interior minister of Pakistan, Muridin Haider did not know that Pakistan was a two-faced country. Now, you can imagine what he feels about it. And then a very interesting one. The wolf and the sheep may drink water from the same stream, but since the start of the jihad, the Aistai extended its roots deep into Afghanistan like a cancer puts down roots in the human body. Every ruler of Afghanistan has complained about it, but none could get rid of it. And uh, finally, and this is very pertinent, and this reflects this report as well, which went to Willie Leakes. Information is the key to any conflict, says Zaif, on behalf of the Taliban. The foreign troops in Afghanistan have poor intelligence. May I read that again? <laughs> the foreign troops in Afghanistan have poor intelligence and have too often listened to people who provided them with false information. And these are those who use the foreigners for their own goals and target their own enemies or competitor. Now, well, it, it is a very good point. And these are specifics of the government questions and also intelligence. But when you take the chorus of the Afghan government, even this past week, saying that there is intelligence leaks, and they may be rogue leaks and rogue generals uh, in the field helping with motorcycles. It was very specific. I uh, Do you think there's any more of that as a holdover, for example? Of These the old quotations day? I chose from this very popular book here, one who's considered a Bible at the moment, are based on a couple of things. One, that the Taliban don't trust the ISI or Pakistan and are abusive towards it in a vociferous fashion. Two, it makes it absolutely clear in their own words that the ISI is a cancer, they will not deal with it. And three, it makes it absolutely clear in their own words that information in Afghanistan is used to fog the enemy's mind. Now, with these very clear explanations, how much have these Afghan leaks come from Afghan informants who they themselves claim are not trustworthy? And how, so, much yeah. how much credulity or credibility shall be given to these people to make this sound like an immense war effort? I mean, this, uh, Pamela, smacks to me somewhat of, um, you know, the, the, the aspect about uh, the weapons of mass destruction, practically. I assure you that neither the Pakistan government nor the people of Pakistan and nor the ISI in Pakistan are weapons of mass destruction. All of them are performing in very difficult situations. I have the IMF report here, which says very adequately, and I quote from the IMF report recently issued, Pakistan's role in the universal war on terror, one important aspect that has severely dented development in Pakistan is its role in the war on terror. Pakistan has sustained immense socioeconomic costs of being a partner in the international counter-terrorism campaign. And it goes on to say, uh, Pakistan's participation in the anti-terrorism campaign has led to massive unemployment 
and it quotes a figure of $30 billion as having been the price of what we have paid directly and indirectly. This is Poverty Reduction Strategy Paper, Chapter 1, and the introduction is Challenges, Opportunities, and Strategy, written by the IMF. Well, this, per, uh, this is, in fact, what President Obama is saying, that this, these facts show the, the idea of what was, and now the strategy is to get closer between the United States and Pakistan. Would you say in some of all of these comments that Pakistan's intelligence in no way is involved with uh, feeding intelligence or helping out the Taliban or al-Qaeda? Look, let me get one thing clear. Here at the United Nations, Abdul Salam Zaif was a man who was called an absolute no person. Uh, he went to Guantanamo and he was released. And lo and behold, he's suddenly become a Pakistan beta sitting in Afghanistan. Now, that's all right as far as we're concerned. But let's just think of it this way, that you, sorry, not you, the, the governments of various P5 countries in the United Nations, the, for the permanent members, have allowed recently a list of Taliban people to be released from the, delisted from the list of the Al-Qaeda committee. And they're talking to them for various reasons. Now, is there a separate thinking? Anyone who needs to be released for talking in Afghanistan, even if they're Taliban, is fine. And if there's Taliban in Pakistan, Pakistan should have no connection to them, even though we're anticipating some form of limited or maybe larger withdrawal coming from ISAF and the Americans. Surely not. You can't, you can't have two ways, even if there are connections. Why go into deniability? I don't want to deny anything. There may be some connection somewhere, but are we saying, and if you have read the Annals of War, Anywhere in the world, you keep certain things in a certain place that, God forbid, if something goes wrong, there has to be something to talk to. They were talking to Hitler's people in uh, uh, Germany before the end of the Second World War. They were undermining him that way. Does that mean today whoever talked to Hitler's people are fascists uh, for talking to them? All right, so let's turn to one other uh, point, not just the WikiLeaks information, and you're making uh, important points about that. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton publicly raised U.S. concerns on this last trip on July 19th in her visit to Pakistan, saying she believes someone in the government, the Pakistan government, knew where uh, al-Qaeda chief Osama bin Laden was hiding in the tribal areas. What is your view of that? Did the Americans know that there was $2 trillion worth of chemicals under the ground in Afghanistan? It suddenly appeared out of nowhere, but surely the satellites had pointed it out many, many years ago. And is your point... Uh... My point is that I'm sure someone in Pakistan may know, but it may be someone who's not within a loop which can be helpful. Anyone would like to... I mean, this man says in this book about the interior minister, and I can read it if you like, that he loves collecting money on heads that he heads, hands over to the Americans. Uh, surely Obama, uh, uh, I'm sorry, surely Osama bin Laden mm -hmm. is a vast uh, source of head money. So if someone knew, I'm sure someone would spill their guts for that amount of money. I don't think that's the point, really. I think also it's no hidden secret that the concentration of uh, Al-Qaeda has shifted to the Yaman, number one, and number two in Afghanistan itself. It is the province of Kunar in the north, which everyone in Pakistan and Afghanistan know is where the Taliban and Al-Qaeda have put up a very formidable uh, enclave. Why isn't anyone doing anything about it? Has the uh, ISAF forces gone into Kunar and ex inspected it for all it's worth? I think they want so us. So your point is to, to get U.S. And, and NATO forces you know, into that. They region. keep telling us, do more. Well, do more is fine. The question is, do more for what? We have limited resources. We even have less money. We keep hearing about the 
$1.5 billion, which we keep having you know, put into our face. We've said thank you for it. It is helpful. But the IMF report itself shows it's not enough to cover what has been even a, a significant portion of our costs. And, and we've already more lost is, that. More is needed. And much more is needed. I'm going to say, please do much more. We need to fight this menace and we need to do it properly. We haven't really been able to supply so many things which are needed at the moment. And um, to say that we are not uh, appreciative, of course we are appreciative. There's any help from anyone is highly appreciated. And there's been some great help from many countries in the West as a partner to this international coalition against terrorism. But is it meeting our requirements? No. Is it helping keep our heads above water? No. In every situation, it gets worth. Yet, we just did a great festival in New York to show our love for this country and the people of this country. And a vast majority of people came from Pakistan and uh, Pakistan. We did it to show we're doing our best. Our best certainly could be better, no doubt about it. But then we're specific in what we want. When we want specifically, we're told, oh, so-and-so feels not, so-and-so feels not, so-and-so feels not. And what I would say, Pamela, that I am one of those trying to help bridges between India and Pakistan. India and Pakistan are very important in this cauldron. And I personally believe that uh, it would be better if any, and, and after a great amount of difficulties, we're progressing forward slowly and steadily. All right, on, uh, just on that front, there's a great fear that when U.S. troops pull out and NATO troops are all out, uh, that there will be more uh, problems between India and Pakistan, and you've addressed one issue. Can you also speak to the fact that there are some reports of a, an increased nuclearization of Pakistan and an agreement with China? What do you say about the reasons for that? Eighteen months ago, the former head of the CIA's Kabul station, Graham Fuller, wrote in the International Herald Tribune, once the U.S. leaves the region, Pakistan will be stable. How do you interpret that? <laughs> I'll ask you. Well, th this is exactly it. My um, uh, old friend Imran Khan says that um, the U.S. should not worry about Pakistan. Once the bombing stops, it will no longer be jihad and the suicide attacks will immediately cease. And you think the idea of the United States withdrawing would help the region? I, I'm not suggesting that. I'm reading to you opinions of two people. And yours? Of very significant. Or the government? My personal belief is that by having declared, no matter how limited time frame of withdrawal, I have said this earlier in many a place, I think there has been uh, disadvantageous to the situation. You never tell the Afghans when you're leaving. They prepare their swords long before you've left. You read the history of Afghanistan. The first Afghan war with the British, the second Afghan war with the British. I remember the general withdrawing from uh, Kabul said that all the way from Kabul to uh, mazar sharif and the uh, tunnel beyond it, they were sniping at their backs even though they were leaving. So the Afghans love that sort of thing. So a timetable is detrimental. I think a timetable has been detrimental. And also, in my the personal US, opinion, the presence is, of the troops. The presence of the troops is the implication of that quote that if the U.S. did pull out, it would be a calmer place. You know, that is uh, not going to be governed by what you and I say politically. There are economic uh, aspects to that. There are aspects that are directly involved with international diplomacy and NATO, etc., etc., etc. But it's a known fact that the Europeans have gone cold on the war. They're pulling back. Each, I think Canada uh, announced last week they're pulling out in 2011. And do you and applaud that? No, I don't. I, I believe, uh, I've said this earlier in your program, um, when McChrystal asked for a certain amount of troops, I think 80,000 was the figure he read, and he was given, I believe, 20 or 30 at the end of the day. Now, that did create a problem for him, and I'm sure must have been important in his frustration that uh, came on much later when he was uh, striking out, because it's a difficult task. It's not easy. There is a common, Richard Haas recently wrote, um, I think, uh, in, um, in the uh, Newsweek or Time magazine, I forget which. In, I don't want to quote it because I don't have it here, and I have great respect for Richard. But I will say this, that he did say that it now seems that 
the war is not winnable. And uh, I think the same has been said by Brent Snowcroft and Brzezinski in their um, uh, dialogue with David Ignatius um, that this has to be done in a multilateral track. And is and, your view, is the government? And Pakistan, view... in all three's mind, is very important in the equation. And does Pakistan's government, does your government believe that the war is not winnable, as these analysts have said? I won't speak for the government on this issue because it's a touchy subject. I sit with you here, giving you opinions of what people are saying, and normally you would be taking your own conclusions from them. But in my personal opinion, I have very little hesitation in saying that the way the war is going, it doesn't seem winnable. And I quote now uh, Mr. Brzezinski to you, where he said, instead of centralized forces that are not in charge in Afghanistan, let's start from the uh, rural areas upwards. Let's build the forces from there with local loyalties that will create the bonding in the whole situation. And I think he's dead right. I respect him a great deal for that thinking. All right. For one last question on a different front across the Atlantic. Uh, the Prime Minister David Cameron has been very critical right now of Islamabad. This week he said uh, he launched the strongest British criticism of Pakistan, warning that the country could no longer look both ways by tolerating terrorism while demanding respect as a democracy. This is coming at a time when your uh, president is heading for Great Britain. What do you think he meant by that and why would he say that? I, I could respect David Cameron's point of view to a degree. But his own press has said either he's the type who calls a spade a spade or he's been completely undiplomatic. So you can take a choice from there. But then I, I think there is, uh, I talked about the orchestration earlier. Uh, this could be a part of the orchestration. Miliband was uh, annoyed the Indians a great deal of his statements in India over Kashmir. And this could be a little tit-for-tat sort of a situation. I don't know. I, I, I don't believe it is, but I'm saying it could be. We're exploring More for his domestic the, audience uh, and for Indian And uh, the other thing that I think is very important to say uh, at this particular stage is that I remember the great uh, moment when Tony Blair stood in the House of Commons and said, 45 minutes away, rests an arsenal that can blow us to kingdom come sort of a situation, not the exact words, mm -hmm. meaning that Saddam has weapons that are 45 minutes away from London. And we knew where that went. Um, I just feel that um, there is a bit of, uh, in all politics, there is a bit of controversy. In all politics, there's a bit of drama. Uh, there are reasons for saying things at different places, I'm sure. I think David Cameron's been a good friend to Pakistan. I think William Hague has been a good friend to Pakistan. I think Mr. Miliband and Gordon Brown are good friends of Pakistan. I, don't think, I think they know what a positive contribution we have to play. But sometimes something needs to be said. Um, all I can say about that is that it's a little unfair and uh, I think needs to be considered because this thing about doing more, each time there is something about to happen, Pakistan needs to do more. Well, I think that is really, uh, you know, putting too many straws on an already overladen camel's back. Thank you, Ambassador Haroon.